Thank you so much for being here. Welcome to the first Women's Wisdom Exchange. Hopefully that means more to come. This is a collaboration of different departments. The Management and Accountancy Department, the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Department, the Career Center, and the Family Business Forum. And the Family Business Forum is part of the Department of Development, and what we do is we provide continuing education for family-owned businesses. And I'd like to welcome any students that are from a family-owned business to uh, see me, because you're welcome to all of our events. We would love to have you. We'd like to learn from the next generation. Um, got some great information right outside on the dessert table, strategically uh, there for you, okay? So today we've got an incredible array of success, experience, challenges, mm -hmm. and insight. And I, um, I'm very excited to um, hear what everybody has to share. I wanna just let you know that I'm gonna pass around this clipboard so that if you're attending this for course credit, make sure you fill it in with your name and the course so that you'll uh, get the credit. Thank you for being here. Help yourself to more if you need to. Um, please feel free. Thank you so much. Oh, one other thing. This is being filmed, so if you have any questions, we certainly welcome them during the presentation, but just raise your hand and I'll come over to give you a microphone so that we can get that on film. There's nothing more frustrating than hearing this wonderful answer, but never knowing what the question is. Okay? All right. Thanks. And uh, Lori Horwitz will uh, be our moderator for today. Thank you all for coming out. And again, um, as Cindy Clark said, and thank you for Cindy Clark for really getting this together. And um, please don't feel ashamed to go up and get seconds and thirds. We've got so much pizza and there's desserts outside. So anytime, get up and get some pizza. Um, be assertive. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Lori Horvitz. I'm the co-chair of the Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program, also associate professor of literature and language. And um, I want to thank everyone for coming, and I thank the panelists for coming here and um, donating your time and your wisdom. Um, I think we're just going to go down the panel right now, and if you could introduce yourself, what you do, and maybe just talk about um, some of the challenges you've had, um, specifically challenges you've had as a woman in the workplace. Um, so we could start with Joyce. Oh, I knew. <laughs> Somehow or the other, I knew that if I were right here in this spot, I would be the, from the start. My name is Joyce Harrison. I recently retired in December as regional director for the Self-Help Credit Union. And I am enjoying every bit of it. And getting up this morning was something of a challenge. <laughs> Um, I must tell you that my challenges in, in the lending field has been a real challenge. Women in the field that I was in was not something that was what I would say of the norm. I was a commercial loan lender, which meant I made loans to businesses throughout Western North Carolina. I did that in 21 counties. Those loans ranged anywhere from $5,000 to $10 million. In the industry, women just aren't seen as being lenders to the businesses because they don't think we understand large business. In the field, as I have seen it in many times, I learned to listen well, and that's something that I have to tell you. You listen, you don't always know the answer, but you listen and you will hear the answer. A lot of times, the men in the room will be talking amongst themselves, so you listen. Your ears are always pert. So when the question comes to you, you're ready to hear and know what the answer may be. So I'll just go ahead and pass it down the road now and let my colleague here. We're, we're a team, by the way, so if I don't know the answer, somebody else will. <laughs> or sometimes the question. I'm Pam Myers. I'm the executive director of the Asheville Art Museum, and I'm delighted to be here. Always like to get on campus and see all of you. 
Uh, I've been in the nonprofit art world since I was a freshman in college. It wasn't something I set out to do, but it found me and kept me. Uh, I think I was blessed to have mentors in a whole host of areas who kept me on a path that to this day I find I am passionate about. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get up in the morning, like, but, uh, but it keeps me going full tilt. Uh, when I certainly when I entered the not-for-profit arts community uh, there were lots of women workers in the arts uh, there were very few women in a position in executive positions in the not-for-profit arts anywhere in the not-for-profit arts whether it was performance visual art um, any other area I mean I think you've all heard about artists themselves and and how women have struggled to be in the system uh, on the management side it was equally uh, equally uh, difficult. Uh, certainly as I was coming up through, it's changed a little bit, but not as much as I think it, it should have. Uh, I think the challenge I had similarly was there weren't great role models. Uh, most of my mentors were men. Um, didn't matter whether they were men or women, but, but they were. I do my best to try to help young women who want to enter the field. And I think from a challenge point of view, what I learned early on uh, was that I needed to know how to do it all. Um, and I needed to, if I didn't, wasn't expert at it all, I needed to know enough about it to ask the right questions and find the right people uh, to help me through it. And that was particularly true, and I'm sure we're gonna hear down the line when you work with um, outside trades who maybe aren't comfortable or willing uh, to work with a woman in a senior position. Certainly it was the case when I worked in Asia where having a woman be in charge was really a surprise and, and a difficulty. Um, likewise in New York, and then coupled when I moved south uh, to be a woman and to be a Yankee, added additional, <laughs> additional challenges to my getting things, getting things done. So I've learned to count on a lot of people in my career and hope others can count on me. Good afternoon, my name is Amuka and I own Malaprops Bookstore, Cafe, and Downtown Books and News in downtown Asheville. Um, my challenges began when I was uh, in college. I was in pre-med uh, and I was one of the three female students out of 120. And every time you turn around, you s they said, you're gonna get married and have children, why are you wasting my time? The male professors. So my um, fight was uh, quietly to remove myself from that world and choose another path, which is also a healing path, recommending good books to anyone. But I wanna tell you that even today, uh, folks will come in and say, I'd like to speak to the manager or the owner, where is he? <laughs> so, um, it's still there and I'm not 100% sure how we're gonna change, except I believe it's one step at a time, being an example and not assuming um, that being a man or being a woman is the answer. Um, we have to be as human beings together and solve issues. That's right. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kathy Hoyle and I am president and CEO of now uh, my family business, Hoyle Office Solutions. Uh, I was born into a male-dominated environment early in my life with three brothers and all were at least 10 years older than me. So it was a challenge from the beginning to, you know, I was looked at as a little sister that um, should just be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. And um, those, that's kind of the way, it, you know, in the Southern style of life too, you were kind of raised that a woman was to, to stay in her place. And um, I remember my dad saying to me, you know, that he wasn't gonna pay for me to go to college. It was a waste of his money. He wanted me to go to a business school to learn accounting and be in the accounting department and basically, again, be seen and not heard. And um, as I 
started looking into the business more and learning all the aspects from the ground up, I, I realized, you know, I had a lot to offer this business. And I, and I had a passion for it, and, and I had a drive. And so I, I just sought out help outside of my family to help me be where I am today. And um, one, of the, one of the things I would recommend the most is if you're, if first is seek your passion and believe in yourself and, and drive for that, but, but to hire a coach and then a business coach that can help you you know, design a plan and also encourage you to, to keep going when those times are tough. But as well as um, surround yourself with local people and friends that will also give you the support. And, and, to, and you know, really I was supported highly by a lot of men, a lot of men in, 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 this, in town that helped me and, and just kept encouraging me that I could do this. And, it's hard with a family business because it does get touchy. You know, you're, you're dealing with a whole different aspect. Uh, you can't leave the family, <laughs> you know. So when you're in a business, you've got business, and you can't walk away from them, and they're just an employee. They're there. And those feelings can get hurt, and it can drive divisions in the family. And it has in ours, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we hope, you know, you can hope to overcome, and I think the best way to do that is make sure you have a succession plan or a buyout plan in place, trust me. Don't do it the way we did it. My dad is 96 and he's still alive today giving me advice. Now one of the nice things I will tell you is that um, he, he does laugh today because with me and, and as I say, Dad, you didn't expect your daughter to be the one that was running your business, did you? You know, and, and he's very proud of me, and I do treasure that now. And, and I'm thankful to have him here still alive and, and able to see what I've been able to accomplish. But it's tough. It's tough when you've got family involved. And, I'm, and uh, <laughs> you can surely tell us that, can't you, Pam? <laughs> yeah, I, well, I've got Oh, you do. I don't have to share my mind. Um, yeah, <laughs> actually, my situation, my name is Laura Dover Duran, and I run my family business, which is Dover Insulation um, in McDowell County. And um, we're the perfect example of why you need a plan <laughs> because my dad died very unexpectedly. Um, and although my grandfather was in this business and it's a, you know, has been a tradition among the men in my family to be in the insulation contracting business, um, none of the, there have ne there's never been a woman um, involved in the business and he died unexpectedly at the age of 58 so and that was 2004 and at that time I have two sisters and at that time I found myself an insulation contractor um, I have a master's degree in English literature so I was not in any way qualified to do this job um, and we had never talked about it um, he did not expect his children to be in the business he he didn't want them to be and honestly I remember thinking as a child that the only job I did not want was my dad's <laughs> so you never know what kind of twist and turn life is going to take but um, I'm very proud to say we've done well um, but it has been very challenging the mechanical contracting uh, industry as you guys can imagine is pretty much 100% uh, male industry and me. Um, so it has been, it is a very traditional Southern, um, you know, affectionately a good old boy um, business. So the challenge that I faced was uh, immense and, and I still say I don't, I think, <laughs> It was stupidity. Somebody told me they didn't think I could do it. So, um, <laughs> as my husband said, okay. Um, that's pretty much a guarantee that I was going to prove them wrong. But it, it, it has, uh, it's not ideal for the person in charge to be the least knowledgeable person in the business, which is essentially what happened when I took over. Um, but my advice in a situation like that is just to ask questions. As you said, surround yourself with people who actually do know what they're doing um, and know where to get the information. I mean, I spent years and years saying, I don't know the answer to that, but I will, um, can I get back to you? <laughs> um, and I think that just admitting that you, um, that you don't know everything. I think a lot of women try to, um, to counter 
um, you know, that position of being an underdog by trying to be fabulous or portray yourself. And in my case, I think I, what saved me is just to, to say to people, you know, I, I know you guys know what you're doing. You know, help me. And a lot of people, I, I've faced very few men. Um, I have a lot of stories to tell. Um, there, I've had some just hilarious situations on job sites and in meetings where, you know, as Emika said, people are like, well, can I speak to the man in charge? I mean, I still get that all the time, you know. And Or when's your husband, is your husband running the business? Yeah. That's my favorite, yeah. you know. It's like, <sighs> um, but, you know, just to to surround yourself with, with folks who, who um, give you good advice. My sisters, while they, I bought them out of the business, my, my younger sister now works in the business and, and it's, it's tricky, but it's good um, to have your family members and it can be good. And so, um, and, her, and she's uh, obviously uh, also a woman and, and a mechanical engineer, so um, in many ways she's more well suited to be running the business. But. Um, but they were very supportive. They wanted it to remain in our family and um, did whatever they could to, to help me. Um, it was a time when you could get money, um, when you didn't, <laughs> nobody should have lent me any money, but um, in those days it was, uh, it was a lot easier. So I've been fortunate in that regard. So, but, so that's pretty much my story. Okay, good. Well, thanks. Um, I have a question. I was reading an essay by Gloria Steinem, and she said that college is the last place you'll find equality between men and women, or mostly equality. It's when you get into the workforce that that's when you really experience um, sexism. And, um, and I was wondering when, um, if for any of you, a moment when you made the connection between being a woman in a leadership role and being discriminated against because of your gender. And maybe if you even have a story where you felt like you didn't handle it as well as you could have, but in hindsight, you're like, oh, I should have said this. You know, because we want to educate people, right? That's part of it. Um, so maybe a time when you maybe didn't handle it as well as you could have, and maybe a time when you felt like you did handle it appropriately. So if any of you have um, a story to share. I was in the corporate world, and I was up on the ladder, of course, and uh, up with the boys there. And um, all of a sudden, I was in charge of uh, $50 million and 40 people. And one of the, uh, one of the people who, were the, uh, who have been there for the longest, 35 years, uh, needed to be fired. And guess who got to fire him? And um, that's when I made my decision that I retain my integrity and I'm not doing this job anymore. And I said so to them and walked out. So uh, there, there, the, you have to follow your heart at times, but you have to throw the stuff they're throwing at you back to where it belongs. Okay. okay. Anybody else have any kind of stories? Or maybe you didn't handle it as well as you could have, or maybe you did handle it really well. I have stories every day where I don't tell the <laughs> jerks who come in to go and, and not pollute here. Um, it's endless, and it happens all the time. And what you have to learn to do is that you have to be a role model for maybe, maybe they'll learn. And the more I stand up to them, the braver I get. Because I come from a world where um, uh, oppression was uh, political and cultural towards girls. Uh, the boy children were the most important and they would be heard, we would not be. And uh, so I had to struggle all my life with the male authority and wanting the approval of him. So I'm constantly working on that every day. Um, and, and stepping up and not allowing things to go on in my businesses where it makes me feel like this is not uh, good intentioned. Or well intentioned. Mm -hmm. I have challenges. I had challenges. And since retirement, I don't have challenges. I just, whatever. <laughs> but, 
but in in the lending field, I would have many people that would call to make complaints about something, and they would want to speak to the manager. Well, my administrative person would always say, well, I'll make you an appointment. Well, they would walk in, and my loan officer, which is was, which was a male, was always around, and so they would always walk in, and they would start talking to him. I would just stand and listen, and again, I tell you, all you have to do is listen. The answers will come to you. So I sat and listened while he stood there and talked with the administrative person and with my loan officer, and they listened. And I walked out of my office and I said, I'm sorry, but you'll have to go through that all over again because I'm the manager. And he looked at me and he said, I mean, I want to speak to the person in charge. And I looked at him and I said, okay, sir, why don't I take you to the conference room and I'll have the manager come sit down and talk with you. Because, you know, I am just, <laughs> because I'm the kind of person that I just, I, I just won't take, I won't take anything. I break a glass ceiling. And I may not break it all the way. I keep cracking it and waiting for somebody else to come behind me and keep cracking it mm -hmm. because eventually I think that one of us will crack that ceiling and it will pop wide open. So I took him in the conference room, sat him down, and then I took all of my staff in. And this is my good part. I took all of my staff in. I introduced him to each one of my staff members. And I said to each one of them, would you tell them who your boss is? And they all looked around and they pointed at me. And I said, sir, is there anyone else that you would like to talk with in this room other than me? And he said, well, um, who's your boss? And I said, I'm sorry, but in Western North Carolina, I cover 28 counties, so it is me that you must speak with. And he immediately turned around and said, sir, can I talk to you? And my loan officer looked at him and said, no, sir, you'll have to talk to her. So at that particular point, my man turned around and walked out the door. Yeah. He was not ready to talk to me. And I can't tell you if it was because I was a female or if I was African American, but I can tell you he was not a happy camper when he left. He wrote a nice long letter to my boss in Durham. He wrote the letter to him. And my boss turned around and said, he wrote him a letter back and said, sir, she covers all of Western North Carolina. It is she that you must talk with. Good for you. <laughs> Great story. Did he talk to you? No. <laughs> he never called back. And his problem was solved. That's right. And, and actually, in reality, I took care of his problem without him talking to me. So it didn't take him talking to me for the problem to be solved. Me knowing about the problem was getting it solved. Wow, great. Anybody else have any stories to share? Don't let me take over. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have so many stories, but um, I would say when when my dad was really sick, and he, he was a, a person who thought his children were, he, he had rose-colored glasses. He's like, you guys will do fine. You're brilliant, you know. And even the people at, at my office now, they say, oh, we didn't believe him because he, he just... He didn't have any perspective on things, but he said to me, and, and this has been so true, because I said, Dad, I don't think these guys are gonna go for this. You know, they're um, just not gonna accept me as the owner of this company. And he said, everybody is gonna underestimate you one time. <laughs> so you just gotta get through one time with everybody. And I can tell you, hundreds of stories about that one time where I'm sitting there with the gentleman in the meeting and I'm you know at a, at a job meeting I mean I to this day this actually happened to me this week I went to a meeting and I'm like you know somebody looks at me and they're like who are you you know very rudely I'm like I, it, I said who I am and they're like how did that happen that was what I got <laughs> so um, it, it happens less and less and, and but truly um, to be underestimated one by one was a, a very good learning experience to me, and my dad's words were in my head all the time. Eventually, everybody's gonna know how great you are. Just, it's gonna take a while. So um, I think 
in general, everybody has been great. Um, I think I've had the huge advantage of being my dad's child. If it if I had been a random thirty four year old woman who bought this, I I hate I hate to even admit it, but I don't know that it could have worked um, because I would have just been chewed up and spat out. Um, but I think having a good sense of humor has been huge for me because you can, I mean, you have to have a thick skin. Um, I mean, there are times when my sister says, oh my gosh, why didn't you just, well, I have the business in my hands. I have 40 people whose families, you know, that business supports. I, I don't have the luxury of being sensitive about everything that's said to me. You know, I, there are time, there are points at which, as Emika said, I'm like, you know what? This is it. No more relationship with this person. But that is really a rare occurrence. I think most um, people I've been able to build a bridge with, and and I think uh, stepping back and saying, okay, I'm a woman. I don't, you know, okay, let's get. How do we get this job done? Get a jump, job done well. And most people really appreciate that. So, um, if I may continue. Um, <laughs> One thing I had to learn, and this was uh, some uh, female mentors who kind of brought me to see this, that I was taking, I mean, it was my babies, these bookstores were in my life and my children and stuff. And so anything that came at me in the, from the wrong angle, I took personally and took it home and all that kind of stuff. And it chewed on me and it was not good for me. So what I had to learn to do is that it's not about me. It's about the issue that that person has, male or female, about something that they're bringing, right, and flopping it in the bottom line. Now, I can take it up and run with it and suffer with it, or I can just look at it, see if it is mine, see if I can do something about it, or f see if I want to do something about it, and then go from there. So separating that and putting that aside is less, a lot less stressful, f family business or not, mm -hmm. that um, made all the difference uh, that's why I still have my sanity and my hair and, and can walk and talk at the same time. I mean, uh, 40 years of book selling, I've, I could say, I can't say I know it all because I don't, but I, I have seen a lot and I've learned a lot and this is probably one of the most important things as a business person who uh, needed to learn that and I did. I still lose it sometimes but then it, they're really going for me, so I'll just give it back to them. <laughs> okay, I'm wondering if um, any of you have tips for students who will be entering the job market very soon, and especially in this kind of uneasy job market. Um, if you have any um, strategies that you can share, um, what you might look for as an employer from students who are just graduating college, male or female? Um, hiring is not easy, and uh, the economic times are not uh, making it easier, and I don't see the future that it's gonna get easier. Uh, some of the success stories we have had were where you know you can get a job, volunteer in the, in the field that you love, and uh, they'll like you, and they'll hire you later. So you're kind of seeding your way, putting the seeds into the garden so that they would hire you. Now, it doesn't work if you need a job tomorrow, um, but that has been a really good approach that I've, uh, we have extended to some of the students. It's really difficult to hire folks who don't have any experience in retail and dealing with people and knowing literature and, so there is a, cur a learning curve there, but we're willing to play if you are. One of the, th one of the things I would tell you is to um, just be passionate about what you want to do and to really make that a part of your daily plan and to seek those that are in the maybe the environment that you'd like to be in or, or any of the businesses that you might be interested in. Surround yourself with those people and get to know them. You know, I think so many times, and especially nowadays, I think we're so prone to a cell phone and 
and I'm sure a lot of you young, you, the young young people here in this room, you, you text more than you call. You call your friends and talk to them, and I think that's where you miss out somewhat. Is is um, being letting letting yourself hear the passion for that that their, their voice carries uh, on that phone call because you you can lose a lot in text and translation, but. Um, I think it's important to um, to actually probably the best way put, to put this is to say you know the best thing you could do is be a shipbuilder, and you say well what's a shipbuilder you know, well go out there and 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 build partnerships and relationships with those people that are in the area of business that you'd like to be in, and surround yourself with them. Be get out into the community. You never know who knows someone else that might connect you and those open up those doors to your opportunities and they also provide you the support that you need uh, to succeed. Um, I, would, I would concur with a lot of those things. Like Emika, we often bring uh, people on as interns and give them opportunities to learn about all aspects of the business which either then lead sometimes to a job with us or at least experience to take to the next to the next place. Um, the networking piece, everybody you know, everybody your friends know, everybody your parents know, everybody your parents' friends know are all fair game and you need to follow up on each and every one of those. Um, what I feel is most important is to find your passion and to be articulate and passionate about what you're looking for to be articulate and passionate about what you bring to the table, whether it's work experience or volunteer experience or ideas, uh, to be prepared for every conversation by doing your homework, to be precise in all of your communications, to check your, punctu your punctuation and your spelling and the formatting of your resume. Um, it is a hard job market. We had, I think, 200 applications for one job recently, and you know, the spelling, syntax, and punctuation, if you don't get it right, you're not in the top pile regardless of what else you're telling me about yourself. So I think those things for me are the network piece, the volunteer piece, and the passionate piece is how to put yourself together and then presenting yourself is key and it goes um, to the comments about texting. You know, I'm a, heart, I'm a great believer in snail mail. It's more formal. It's more professional. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get to me, you send me a letter, you know, with a stamp on it. You don't text me. You don't send it to mailbox.org hoping it's going to get to me. You know how to spell my name. You do all of those things that um, we forget about in our interchanges, friend to friend and person to person. But I think when you're out there trying to take your next step, uh, it's really important to have that that under your belt. And we run a pretty informal office, everybody does everything, everybody works together, but it makes it no less um, important to make a good first impression, and that includes what you're wearing, and I think maybe that's a bigger issue for men, for women than for men, uh, but wear business attire, um, do it right, and I don't care whether you have 18 tattoos, but I'm not sure I need to see them the first time I meet you. Um, and, and I work in an arts organization, and I'm, you know, totally behind that, but you know, if you're, especially if you're coming asking for a job in visitor service or public information, you know, I don't have an issue with it, but I think you have to be very considered as a woman about how you're presenting yourself to an, a potential employer. And that's different than how you might present yourself to a friend. I think my biggest thing is I, do a, I used to do a lot of phone interviews before I did in-person interviews. And I did it because I would call the, the applicant first and say, I want you to research my organization. Because our organization has four umbrellas. And I needed them to read about who we were and what we do. We have a lending organization along with we have what we call a policy organization. We work out of uh, Raleigh and we work out of DC. So I wanted them to understand what type of organization that they were coming into. And Believe it or not, a lot of times when I did those phone interviews, they would say, I didn't have time. Don't ever 
<laughs> ever say that. Even if it's the truth when you're talking to someone, if they have requested before the phone interview that you do some research, please do the research up front. And do not apply to an organization that you don't know because you don't know what you're getting into. Always research a business before you apply. Even though it is a passion for you to do it, know what that impassion entails within the organization that you're applying to. Um, I th the one thing I would add to that, it's all great information. Um, you know, I've had a lot of, um, I had one woman come in and she, during her interview, she had a gap in her employment history, which lots of women do, and I said, you know, what was going on? So she says, she said to me, my assistant was just dying, um, I feel like the right thing to do is for women to stay at home until their kids are 10. I mean, I'm sitting here with my, you know, infant children's pictures behind me. Um, and I said, oh, really? That's the right thing to do? Well, sometimes that's not possible. And she said, uh, now famous quote in my office, well, it's, it's, God's, it's God's plan for women. So um, needless to say, I didn't, she did not get a second interview. But um, that's just a ridiculous example of what people will say in interviews, you know. Um, if you have had a bad job experience, do not dish. This, again, seems obvious, but this happens all the time. Do not talk trash about your former employer, ever. Okay, that is the red flag that basically I just stand up. You know, my dad always said, when you're ready for it to be over, just stand up. Well, I just, okay, bye. Um, if they're talking, you know, if you have a bad experience, it happens, you just don't bring it up or find something positive to say about that experience because um, I don't hire I just don't hire people who do that um, and gr grammar I mean I know I work in construction but um, resumes with spelling errors the 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 name my father used to say the most important and pleasant words that anybody could hear is their own name pronounced correctly don't mispronounce people's name. Figure out how to pronounce it before you get in there. Um, because that just rings. I mean, for you guys who have unusual names, you know what that feels like. Do your homework um, and make sure that you don't have silly grammatical errors in your emails. And turn your cell phone off. <laughs> turn it off. If it rings, immediately take it and silence it. You know, if you get a text message, do not look at that phone. Do not look at it. No matter how much you want to look to see who just texted you, don't do it. Um, so those are my little pet peeves. Um, if I may add to this, um, I just got a letter in a form of application. It came in the mail. And it hadn't written, which was fine. And um, the customer, or this particular person, has been a customer uh, in the bookstore at Mellon Price a couple of times and asked her questions. So she made sure that we all knew her face and that she was there in the, in the community. And as the letter goes on, that she's a uh, you know, university student transferring to UNCA soon in the summer program or the fall program, and she would really like to work. Uh, at the bookstore, but she buys all her books on Amazon. <laughs> okay, don't don't do that kind of a mistake. She wrote that in the letter. She wrote that in the letter. Uh, one of the one of the things that we do. Um, is we look at our customers, we make contact with our customers. So if you're supporting your community, uh, you gotta support your community that you wanna work in. If you want the community to support you, you gotta support the community that you choose to support. And the possibility then of uh, getting a relationship and maybe getting a job is 100% better than a stupid letter like that. <laughs> Yeah, I would add, too, that, um, I mean, if you come to the art museum for a job, internship, volunteer, or paid, you better have been to the art museum. Mm -hmm. You better be prepared for me to ask you if you saw a work of art that spoke to you and be articulate about what it said to you. Um, 
but in that confines of doing the research and being prepared that Joyce talked about, I really want people who are coming in to talk to me to have something to offer to me. You know, I want you to look at my website. I want you to tell me what works and what doesn't, what you found useful, that you had a hard time finding my contact information or phone number. I mean, let me know you've done the research, but don't be afraid to give me your opinion about something. You know, we are all, I think in all of our businesses, it's all about customer service. It's all about the visitor experience in our language maybe versus customer, yeah, yeah. but it's all about that, and, and I think we all very much want to hear mm -hmm. feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, but researched, phrased, and presented you know, in a professional kind of way. Because that's what I'm going to want of you as an employee, is that you speak your mind and that you come to the table with your specific expertise. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Um, I have a question, and it's, more about um, how women in business, women in leadership roles, business, politics, um, they're, how they're portrayed in the media and in Hollywood. Um, and I'm thinking specifically women in leadership roles. When you think about a Hollywood film, what do you see? You see the one woman in the boardroom, the bitch in the boardroom, right? Um, I'm thinking also D Demi Moore in <laughs> Margin Call, um, yeah. if anyone saw that. Yeah. Um, how do we break this break down the stereotype? How do we break it down so we so the media provides uh, more of role models for women, so they're not scared to go up and be um, leaders in business and politics? I just I don't know how many of you came when we had the Gorilla Girls here um, a couple of years ago now, and um, Frida, who was the Gorilla Girl. I don't know. Do you know who the Gorilla Girls are? They're a group of activist artists who have been working for 30 plus years uh, on gender equality issues, specifically in the arts, but in other areas as well. And Frida's current project actually is doing research in the film archives at the Getty in order to prepare an assault, basically, on the film industry as an artist um, through the kinds of mechanisms of language and art that this group of, of women bring to their advocacy advocacy uh, for women's rights. So I think there's something coming out that's going to be going to be pretty pretty great. I think um, anybody who sat on a board as a volunteer or working for a board, um, I guess my, my, my feeling is to take something Emica said, which is that you got you got to take it out of the being personal and put it in the being professional pile so that you're able to assess the situation and deal with it professionally and hopefully not take it home and chew on it at two in the morning when you should otherwise be sleeping. Um, and I certainly hope that as time goes on and more and more women do um, take on some traditionally difficult paths that that those role models will roll back into into film and media. But I, I sure do like the way the Gorilla Girls go after it in the here and now. Yeah which is with humor, it's with humor, but it's with incredible research documentation, statistical analysis, and really sharp language. Mm -hmm. Well, I've sat on many boards. Um, many times I've been the only female. Many times I've been the only African American. And so I must tell you, it is, it's difficult to not say something when you see an inaccuracy going on or, and some type of e inequality going on and board policies are set for an organization. And I'm not the one to sit back and be quiet. So, so you're the bitch the I am. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would always state my point but I would always back it up with some type of fact. And I think that's where I was respected a lot for doing that. I served on a bank board, and one of the guys came to me afterwards, and he said, I don't think any other woman would have said what you did in that room, but it was right on time. I said to him then, but you didn't say anything to back me up. So, so for me, I will just say it whether or not they want to hear it if it's right in my heart. 
and if it's right as a fact. The same thing happened as I was sitting on the hospital board. I say what is right for the patients, for the staff, and I've done it on many occasions. And I've been the bee in the room, but it is the right thing, and I back it up with a fact. If you're going to say something, and if you're going to be in that boardroom, you have got to be prepared for the meeting. You have got to be prepared to back up whatever it is you're going to say. You get the agenda ahead of time. You study the agenda. You go into the room ready to fight with that agenda on what you think is the principal right thing to do. And yes, many times I am the bee in the room. And, and, but at the same time, I can tell you, I earned a lot of respect because I stood up for what I knew was the right thing. And if you stand up for the right and the right thing, and you pick, pick it up and put it with a fact, they can't knock you down. They can't knock you down because they would have to come with that fact and knock it back out. So that's what I say to you. If you're going to do it, back it up with the fact. Don't just go in a room saying something just off the cup with your passion. Say it with the passion, but say it with the fact. So that it was betrayed, that it was not an emotion that you put out there, but it was this is it. This is the fact. Okay. Um, I would say about, and this is off the subject of your question, but regarding women in industry or business having uh, emotion, because that's very much part of the stereotype, is that you uh, can't handle your emotions and you're not going to be able to make the hard decisions. And, and I can say, I mean, I had a situation where <laughs> I was crying at work all the time. I mean, my dad had died. You know, I had this very horrible situation where I didn't know what I was doing. And, and there was a lot of tears shed. I would get you know, my employee meetings, there was actually a moment where um, Ted, who's my vice president, came to me and he said, that was really a good meeting. You didn't cry. <laughs> and, and it was like this huge thing, you know. Um, but at some point, I was just like, guys, because it's all guys, mm -hmm. I'm going to. And they would cry. I mean, I have brought construction workers to tears on numerous occasions. <laughs> and my assistant tells me, she's like, I've never seen more men come in our office and cry in my life. I mean, they come in to tell me their child. You know, part of that is I have a special relationship with them because I am a woman. Um, and I, there's a lot of good things about that. And I think if you had my, my guys in here today, they would... Um, say, you know, their challenges to having me as their boss because, um, you know, we are in, in the world that we're in, but there's also a lot of advantages. And I, and I, I don't do it at all the way my dad do it, did it. And I think that the advantage of being the daughter is that nobody expects you to do it the same way. You're totally different. And um, I just, for a long time, embraced the emotional part of it. I mean, it, it was it was what it was. I think it dis, it demonstrated my dedication to that company and to my family name and my dad and and you know I, we had very hard times and they saw it and we just um, I pushed through and now I only cry rarely at work, <laughs> um, but uh, I just think that's kind of something you have to get past. You know I'm a woman and I've worked in corporate settings too where. You know, um, you just try, you're sitting there, I'm not going to get upset, you know, and it feeds on, you know, sometimes people just get upset at work. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're not good at your job. Um, it doesn't mean you're not trying, you're not smart, you're not, you know, um, I felt like I had to work a lot harder mm -hmm. because I was a woman. Um, and I still think I do. I'm the person who comes to the meeting prepared, you know, I, then they're just like, oh, rustling through their pay pages and I'm like, I do, I think that's part of that is just where you come from, from being a, a woman. And in my case, you know, I started when I was relatively young. I mean, the job has aged me significantly since then, but, um, but you know, being a young person also, I think, you know, people are like, what's she doing here? And what does she know? So um, I would say don't be afraid to be, um, express yourself. 
regardless of the business that you're in, because I think people appreciate honesty, you know, um, and a, a lot of times honesty is being upset. So. Don't be afraid to be different, even in business. Mm -hmm. um, there's a traditional way of doing business and there's a non-traditional way of doing business. And you need to choose which one suits you more. I chose the non-traditional. The banks didn't give, loan me money. They left me out of town. Uh, the, when I opened the bookstore in 1982, uh, the town was dead. Uh, they, were, they were saying, oh, women-owned business. Oh, let's check them out. What does that mean? Do they have horns? What's happening here? <laughs> it took seven years of patience of opening the doors every day and saying, okay, today's going to be a better day. Today's going to be a better day. Because I believed and I was passionate about this little town, the mountains, the architecture, and the possibilities of deserving a good bookstore, which I think every effing community in this country deserves. Somewhere where you go in and you see new voices, new literatures, you, you meet interesting writers, and it's a relationship. And the business part of it is not necessarily the dollar sign. The business, the success, I mean, the business part of it is you have to pay the bills. But the success of it is how happy the community is and how happy you can make yourself in that community. Okay, thanks. Um, we're going to have time for a few questions, so if you have questions for any of the panelists or all the panelists, anybody have any questions? Okay, there's a question here. Um, oh, hold on. Laura, I'm put you on the spot. <laughs> you had to figure it, it was coming. Um, this is for Laura. I, um, I know you to have two very vivacious, intelligent young ladies at your house. How would you feel if they wanted to take over the family business, and how would you prepare them? Well, first of all, you join the family business for them. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a great question, and um, they're young still, but the honest truth is they both tell me on a regular basis that they want to work at Dover, and I say, no, you don't. <laughs> um, but you know it's a process and I think the main thing is just talking to them about it mm -hmm. um, there may be a point and I think in every family business you know you have to weigh you know do I want this to be a family business do I want my kids to have this responsibility I basically I, I want my children to do whatever their heart leads them to do um, and if it's something that seems impossible I hope that my example has been you know what, nothing's impossible. And if you feel like you can be an insulation contractor, <laughs> then go for it. Um, and that is very much what my dad's approach was. He did not expect us to be in the business. None of us ever expressed a desire to do it, but he felt like we were capable of anything that we tried. And, and so I would say to them, let's talk about it. You know, we'll, if that's what you want to do, um, we'll figure it out. But I want them to have, I don't ever want them to feel responsible, you know, like they need to do that um, because, you know, they had to find their own way. And, and who knows, I have no idea. You know, like I said, I, I certainly did not think I would be in this business um, in a million years. I would never have predicted it. So, um, you know, I'm open for whatever they they want to do. Um, I also have nieces and a nephew who they work, you know, they come and work in the business work and they trash the office with their jobs. But, um, you know, we all, to me, it's more about work ethic and that's what I want my kids to have. I want them to to have the work ethic, whatever they choose to do. And I kind of see the family business. My grandfather did it, my dad did it, I'm doing it, my sister works there. You know, we're hard workers, you know. Dovers are hardworking people, whatever you do. And that's just what I want for them because they're, you get back what you put in. And so. Okay, other questions? For, for any of the panelists, there's a question. Um, in approaching an internship, what do you find most impressive? Like, do you think it's a letter or an email or a call or what would you find most impressive in an applicant? I would say letter. Do I don't like to be called. I mean, calling just bugs me. I don't know how y'all feel, but um, I hardly ever take those calls. But I would say a letter and also a, um, a, a willingness to do anything. 
I find these days, I'm starting to sound old, but people just, they have very high-minded notions of internships. So when I was an intern, you did every, you know, you did whatever. And I think a willingness to do that is very important to convey that, you know, I will do whatever. And it, usually you get to do other stuff, but I think it's important to um, understand that you're there to assist and, you know, you're not going to be like, so that's the approach I would take. <laughs> And I would agree with Laura because we self-help employs about 100 interns a year. And so if you're putting on your resume or your letter, and letters are very important for us, if you're putting on your letter that you were open to any position, then it gives us the opportunity to put you in a position that we have open or feel that we know that you might fit according to your resume. So just leave it open. Don't just be very specific. A lot of people send in those resumes and say, I specifically want to work in policy. Well, that may not be something that we have an opening in. It may be something that we have in, in research. So for us, if you just leave it open, you could possibly move around in that job once you're there, and it doesn't tie your hand and not get you hired as an intern. Yeah, and I, I'm, we do tend to list internships in specific areas, and so if you have a specific need in our case, um, you know, let us know what that is, um, although leaving yourself open to anything that might come your way. Uh, I'm really interested in how you, how you spin the experiences you've had, both educationally, familial, in your family, in your own personal work, and how you see those as connecting to the mission and vision of my organization. Um, so that, I, again, it's the same question of needing to know that you've thought it through and you've articulated it um, and that you're willing to do anything, you know, when you get there. But I really want to know you've done your homework. In our case, um, even though we're a profit, for profit, we're not profitable. Um, <laughs> But uh, my, the whole um, idea that if you support something, it will support you. If you walk in there, if you've never been there, and nobody ever has heard of you, uh, there are other people who are part of the community that's there, and they also want an internship. So who do you think is going to get it? So not necessarily have to spend a whole lot of money there to get to know and talk about books or just have a cup of coffee with friends so that you have, and we have, a sense of, okay, we are a community. Um, I find that uh, my college degree did that much for me. And as, as everybody else in this uh, panel, uh, had to work from there, you have to learn. You have to clean the bathroom, you have to sell books, you have to order books. You do everything. It's not, nothing is not to be done. Everything has to be done. So interns will start at small steps, but you know, if it's a good community relationship, it will blossom. Yeah, and I would add to that, I think, the, the community commitment, showing that you have a passion and commitment for the field that you're applying. But I would go back to the early part of the conversation, which is that if you know somebody who knows somebody who is willing to let you use their name, mm -hmm. the network is where it all happens, um, whether it's a faculty member here, whether it's somebody, a friend's mom or dad, wh whatever, whoever that person might be, if I get a letter, um, from Cindy that says, you know, I really want you to, you know, do me a favor. You're going to get a resume and a letter from so and so. She's somebody I've known for a long time. I'd really like you to talk to her. Mm -hmm. You know, goes to the top of the pile. You may not get the job, but but I will do as a courtesy to Cindy. Um, we'll make sure that that meeting happens. So, um, and look at your contacts broadly, you know, and let the fingers go out from there. Okay, um, any final words of wisdom? Final words, be punctual. <laughs> if you say you're gonna be at an interview or make a phone call at 10 o'clock, don't make it 10 after 10. Be punctual, check and recheck your resumes. 
don't send out garbage because it goes to file 13. If anybody's familiar with file 13, mm -hmm. okay, that's where it goes because a lot of times you, we just won't look at it because if, it's, if, if you're sending us that as your first approach of applying for a job, what are you going to do in the job? So that first appearance is what you see. Again, turn off the cell phones. Do not text. Your appearance, the way you look, is your first impression is what will be seen for the rest of your career. Be good at what you want to be. Be the best at what you should be. I have one pet peeve, which is that I don't like you to say um every other word. And I have some staff people that do that. Drives me ink crazy. Um, if you need um to take a break, just take a break. Mm -hmm. Just don't fill the break with um. Or if you're preparing for an interview, have somebody sit down and listen to you talk. And if you use the word um, have them count how many times you did it in the last 15 minutes. Um, because sometimes it's an unconscious thing and it's about training yourself out of that. That's just a, a personal pet peeve. I think because my father counted ums at the dinner table. <laughs> um, I just want to say that I never worked for a woman in my entire professional career. Uh, from the time I was a freshman in college and, and worked on campus and even before that in high school. And I would just like to add my voice to everybody else's in saying that I hope I've done my man the management side of my job maybe better than some of the men that I worked for. I learned a lot of a lot of things from those guys. That That's not the point, but I hope my style in working with my colleagues and in creating and building teams uh, is, I know it's different than theirs was, and I think it's really served to support my organization's progress through time. And that team is composed of men and women both. Uh, I believe I work with them fairly, despite their genders. Um, and and we're, we're male challenged in my building. There's not so many males on the staff. Um, but but I, do, I, I do think my style's different than those that I work for. I hope it's better. I do know that the commitment to, to teamwork is substantially different. And I think one of the other things, I don't often cry in the office, but it's been known to happen. <laughs> Staff do come in my office and cry. That happens maybe even more. Um, but I do know that my team really feels like a team, and they draw together through the good times and the bad times in any of their personal lives, and that I support that and give that time, and I honor it. And that I try very hard also to be acknowledging work that's done on behalf of the institution and um, and not letting it slide, but telling people good things as well as less good things. Okay, and we'll have a final word from Kathy Hoyle. Oh, okay. Well, so I know I a just, lot of students have to go back to class. Oh, okay. I, All right, I'll make this quick. I, I don't don't be afraid to fail. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know that that's one of the things that I, I was fearful of it many times, but I've learned so many times now that those failures are actually what made my successes along the way. So believe in yourself and, and step out there and take action because it's better than, than not taking action. Um, I'd like to say that my, the men in my family, were uh, they, they procrastinate to the nth and it used to drive me crazy. And, and I find that now in business, I make decisions and we move and we, we are seeing changes come from that. And I'm having a lot of support from my team just for those changes, so don't be afraid to fail. On that note, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the fine panelists we had today. And there's more pizza, so please take a piece before you leave. Thanks. <laughs>